We there? Yeah. All right, there it is. Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. How you guys doing? Yeah. Amen. Sweet presence of the Lord in here tonight, as I know that there is every time you come and you gather and assemble here together. I was talking to uh, Joe a couple of days days ago, yesterday, I think yesterday, he had like a really, really blessed time here, was really, really blessed by you guys and your reception to him, trust you were blessed as well, anything he said wrong, don't worry about it, Pastor Jim, come back, fix it up for you, straighten it all out, you'll be just fine, you'll be just fine, don't worry, nothing's changed, uh, speaking of Pastor Jim, I spoke with him earlier today, uh, down there, Coral Beach and the Outer Banks having a, an absolutely fantastic time. As I was talking to him, he said, yeah, right now, Les, I'm sitting here uh, on my upper balcony overlooking the ocean. It's beautiful. It's a red flag day. You guys know what that means? It means you can't get in the water. How many of you guys weren't getting in the water in the first place? <laughs> Half of you, right? Yeah, there's sharks and undertoes, and, and it's cold. But we were there last week at Coral Beach, about probably five minutes from where Pastor Jim is staying. Uh, he must have believed God harder than we did because we had, like, clouds and rain every day. He's got the sunshine and warm weather. But he has red flags. He can't get in it. So anyway, but he was having a, he's having a really, really good time. I know he's uh, getting refreshed. How many people went with him? Like half the church? Something like that. Somewhere, somewhere around there. Quite, a, quite a few people. Yeah. It's always a good time when we go down there. We have to take a bunch of family because otherwise you can't afford it, right? It's, it's too much money. So children and friends and moms and all kinds of good things. It works out great. So anyway. Praise God. Uh, tonight, uh, I guess the title, very original title I came up with, you've probably never heard it before, it's called The Blessed Hope. Um, I know it's been used quite a few times, but it's none the worse for the wear and still a good title. Um, brother over there just gave a good word that was uh, right on course with what we're going to be talking about tonight. We just want to see his face. We're just looking forward to seeing his face. That's, that's every moment of our lives. That's what we're waiting for right now in our lives. And I'm not tonight, um, we're just going to have some uh, exhortation and encouragement and talk really more than anything else. Uh, I'm not here to give you a theological uh, dissertation or a doctrinal statement on how we come up with the pre-trib rapture or any of these kind of things or the doctrine of the blessed hope. You guys are very, very well taught and you don't need for me to do that. What I am here to do is just to encourage us all tonight. You guys encouraged me by being here, and I'm encouraging you by standing up here and talking, and uh, we're encouraging one another just in the presence of the Lord tonight here. Uh, but why don't you go ahead and uh, turn to Titus chapter 2. We'll kick off with this. And um, one thing I found out for 20-some years of standing up in pulpit talking is that I want to come nowhere close to finishing tonight and come nowhere close to getting like more than three of my scriptures out usually. I usually have a, a couple of pages of them. I usually don't do very well at sticking to them. So we'll see what God has. Hopefully somebody will get something out of it. But um, if at the end of this, at what time do we, there's no clock. Whenever you're ready. That's a really small clock far away. <laughs> okay, I got to watch. So we usually shut down at what, quarter till or nine o'clock? What do we do? Nine. Nine Nine thirty. it is. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So if it feels like I don't finish, it's because I ran out of time and I talked too much like, like I am right now. So go ahead. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. You guys are familiar with all of these scriptures we'll be going over tonight. But starting in verse 11, it says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this. By the way, I'm, this is New American Standard. If you guys are like, what is he talking about? New American Standard. I always teach out of it because this is not 1611. Um, so, anyway, um, <clears throat> in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing, you hear that? The blessed hope and the appearing and the, of, and the, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, purify <clears throat> and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. You and I are looking for the next great thing on the horizon for you and I is the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there's a, I'm a, an avid end times teacher. I got born again reading the book of Revelation. Most of you guys have heard that testimony before. I won't go into it. And I really, really can get into the end times and these kind of things. Uh, but one thing about the end times is we're not in them. 
No, we are living in the end times. We are not going to be here for the great tribulation period. That's not what we're looking for. We're not looking to figure out who the Antichrist is or how the one world government's all coming together and all these things, although I find those things fascinating. I really do. Uh, we're not looking for the debut of Antichrist. We are looking for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are looking to see him face to face, to stand and behold him and see him as he is, as he truly, truly is. Right now we see him in words and words create pictures in our mind. And you guys all know the song, I can only imagine, right? By, who is that? Mercy. Yeah, exactly. Mercy me. I can only imagine. And that's true. Right now, someone said we see through a glass darkly. Right now, we see through a glass darkly. We imagine what it could be like when we see him. But one thing we know, he says it hasn't entered into the hearts or the minds of a living man. <laughs> what God has in store, a plan for us, we simply don't know how wonderful it's going to be. And the greatest imagination you can come, with, uh, come up with falls far short. When we stand there, we're going to stand before him without reference to sin, meaning that we're going to stand before him and he's not going to talk to us about the sins and how bad of a person we are and all messed up things like that. Because 1 John 3, 16 through 18 talks about how if we believe, we are not judged. And if we don't believe, we're judged already. You know, Jesus didn't come to the world to condemn the world. He is not sending anyone to hell. Some I heard someone say recently, he just threw up a roadblock, said that you don't have to. You're already on your way to hell. You were on your way to hell. He just simply threw up a roadblock so you don't have to have made the way to put a stop to that. So whosoever will, right? Whosoever, whoever believes on him, that he died, was raised again on the third day, that he is king of kings and lord of lords, the coming savior, the coming Messiah. Whoever believes that in their heart, not with their mind, but in their heart, they shall be saved. Amen? Amen. I believe, God, that's all of us in here tonight. And if it's not, it needs, yeah, it needs to change right now because the things we're going to be talking about may come upon you tonight if, you don't, if you're not in that condition, if you're not born again, if you don't know him. Again, we're not going to go into the particulars of the end times and these kind of things. More you and I and where we are today and the emphasis that's been in the church that's been going on in the world. How many of you guys keep up with current events? Just to some degree, to some degree, you, you either, how many guys watch the news or watch, I don't know, follow some podcast or blog or something, Ben Shapiro or any of these other guys, you watch those, yeah, right, he's cool, right? A little Jewish guy, Jordan Peterson, some of these guys, all these, I can't even think of all their names all of a sudden, but I can picture their faces, all of these guys who are political commentators and they're conservatives and all of these kind of things. And if you do watch the news and you do listen to these, you get really, really, really mad. You get really, really mad. How many guys can get really mad when you hear what's happening to our country? Do you get mad? I get mad. Some of you are like, I don't care. I don't even know what's happening. Something's happening to our country. <laughs> what? Uh, turn on the television. It'll take you like 15 seconds. You'll get the picture and, and woe, gloom, despair will come upon you. It's really depressing uh, from a natural standpoint and from a natural point of view, what is happening and what is taking place. And the sad thing is that fear has gripped the church, at least in this country, maybe across the world, uh, with the same fear that uh, the world has. Now, it's an interesting thing because all across the world right now, it doesn't matter if you believe in God or not, everyone has the same, it's in the air. The air is charged with it. There's a tangible something on the horizon and everybody is fighting for their position to make what it is they want to happen come to take place. But people know change is happening. Something is coming. Most of it is, is gloom and doom. And most of it seems very ominous and very much uh, fearful for the people of the world. And, well, they should be afraid because very bad times are coming upon them. You and I... We're looking to stand before the Son of Man, amen, to see him face to face, to encourage one another with this hope. See, these things that are coming are not to bring fear in the heart of a believer. I can get really worked up, and I am not politically active. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. Amen, amen. Okay, amen. Right now, there's such an emphasis in not our ministry in particular, uh, but in the church, and it really bothers me. To see men, supposed men of God, standing in the pulpit on television and on their podcasts, just telling us how we're to involve ourselves in this world. That you have a civic duty. Get out there and vote. And if you don't vote, you don't have a right to complain. And all of these things, and they manipulate the people and they move the people and they uh, persuade the people to get involved and become earth dwellers. On the earth dwellers. Let's go ahead and turn to Luke 21. Here, I want to look at a scripture. I'm not going through Luke 21. I just want you to look at the last couple of verses here, and you're familiar with these as well. Let's see here, probably. 
probably 34. And of course, you guys know that Luke 21 is the equivalent of Matthew 24 and Mark 13. It's the, all of that discourse. It's talking all about the last days, the end times, and all the signs that, that are going to take place. Uh, Matthew includes some things that Luke doesn't. Luke includes some things that Matthew don't, doesn't. Gives you a little more insight on some certain things. Mark 13 is kind of a, like the short version summation of it all. Uh, there are the Olivet Discourse, but it tells you all the bad stuff that's coming. Wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and pestilences and nation against nation, which, of course, we know I've told you before uh, when I was here last time, I think. Uh, and Pastor Jim, I'm sure, has told you that's ethnos against ethnos, race against race. Have you guys ever heard anything about race recently, BLM and all these other kind of things? And white people hate the black people who hate the Mexican people who hate the Spanish people who hate the, you know, hate the, the black. It's, it's, it's terrible. It is. It really is. It's gotten really, really bad. And it has been stirred up again. It was like... I mean, there are still rednecks in the South. Don't, don't get me wrong. Okay. And there's black necks in the North. And there's people who are always going to hate people. But on a national level, it's been stirred up again. Right? It has been stirred up hardcore. It is a useful tool in the hands of the enemy to divide, separate, make you not trust each other, make you not trust your government, make you not trust anything. And when you get there, you've won the war. When nobody believes in anything, trusts anything, there's no unity in a nation, there's nothing left. And that's okay, because this is not God's nation. We'll, we'll talk about that maybe a little bit. But you hear of all of these things, nation against nation, ethnos against ethnos, kingdom against kingdom, that's country against country, all kinds of bad things. And the Olivet Discourse brings all of these things out. And we don't need to sit there and hash any of that out, because it's like abundantly, overwhelmingly obvious what day we're living in. It's abundantly, overwhelmingly obvious as to the signs of the times and how they've come together uh, here. But he says in verse 34, because this is what you and I want to focus on here. He says, be on your guard that your hearts may not be weighted down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life, that that day should come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all of those, and I like this verse, who dwell on the face of the earth. But keep on the alert at all times, praying in order that you may have the strength to escape all of these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. A lot of key things right here uh, in these, these uh, little verses. Of course, it starts out with be on your guard. Watch out. Don't let your hearts be weighted down. Don't get involved in the affairs and the cares and the burdens of this world and of this life. And we'll look at a couple of things perhaps uh, in regard to that. We're going to go to 2 Peter 3 in just a moment. And look at some things in more detail. But he says, be, be on your guard. Don't get caught up in everything that's going on. Begin to, uh, to eat and drink with the drunken and, and beat your servants. That's a different scripture. I'm tying them in together right here. But he says that day is going to come upon those who are not aware, who are not looking, who are not discerning the times uh, of the Lord's return. It's going to come upon them suddenly like a trap. Have you guys ever worked with traps before? Anybody, any trappers in here? I'm not a trapper, um, but I've made a few traps, you know, before, and they, and they like, killed animals. They worked. Um, anybody a veteran? Anybody go to Vietnam in here? No? Nope. Yeah, me either. I was a kid. But I've seen, I've seen a lot of Vietnam movies, all right? In all of these movies, the Vietnamese were into psychological warfare and, and a lot of these kind of things. And they were like masters at, at setting traps and movie traps and all kinds of things. And uh, you're walking along in the jungle. The next thing you know, you get swept up and you're stuck to this spike full of, this board full of bamboo spikes and you're dead. Or you fall into the fit on the same bamboo spikes and you're dead. Or just something comes and takes your head off. But the trap comes and springs upon you and you're not aware. You're just going along with your business and they're concealed, they're hidden, and boom, it happens. So is the day of the Lord. It's going to come that quickly and that strong upon all of those who dwell upon the face of the earth. Now, we can see a similar phrase in the book of Revelation, which we will not go to um, when he's speaking to the churches. And he said, this hour, I will save you from the hour that is about to come upon all of those who dwell upon the face of the earth. Now, right here, uh, he says, for it will come upon all of those in verse 35 who dwell upon the face of the earth. Thus, years ago, and I'm sure he's not the first one, but Pastor Scott kind of coined the phrase earth dwellers. Are you a citizen of the kingdom of heaven looking up or are you an earth dweller? You're no longer looking up, but you're now looking horizontally. What's going on in the world? And you've involved yourself in the world. And now you've become invested in this world. And this world is now your home, even though you would doctrinally say, no, it's not. Is the day-to-day -day life that you live caught up in that? 
you all have to go to work, right? We got to work. You have to involve yourself in certain things. We've got to mix with the world, but we're not of the world. We know all of these kind of things. But are you preoccupied with the world and the state of the world and the condition the world's in? Are you feeling you want to try to change it? Are you feeling you want to try to make it better? But he said, be careful of that because this thing's coming upon the earth. All, all those who dwell upon the face of the earth, the earth dwellers, those who are not looking, those who are oblivious, those who are unaware, those who are weighted down. We could go to the parable of the... The, the seed and the different ground it falls on and those who get weighed down with the cares and burdens and the, they get choked by vines and all of these kind of things. Lots of scriptures we could turn to uh, for that. But there's another key statement in verse 36 here. Keep on the alert at all times. He's really emphasizing this, this being alert, being awake, watching at all the time because the Lord's coming for those who are looking for him. But keep on the alert at all times praying in order that you have strength to escape all of these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Escape these things that are going to come upon all of those who dwell upon the face of the earth and to stand before the Son of Man. Two different loca locations going on here. Two different things happening. You want to escape all of this. Now, you and I are living in some rough times, and you and I will suffer persecution. Uh, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And we talk about the persecutions to come and some of the horrible things. Not all persecution comes in the form of uh, bodily harm or imprisonment. It comes in being shunned by your family members. It comes in, in the form of people at work when you're done. They don't want to associate you. They kind of talk behind, there's that Christian girl. There's that guy. They, they don't want to associate with you. They think it a strange thing that you don't eat and drink with them and carouse with them and party with them, that you don't have the same spirit. They think it a strange thing that you walk around this peace that you have all the time uh, in you, that you're looking at all the madness that's going on in the world and all the chaos. And they're thinking, aren't you concerned? What's wrong with you? You must be touched. You must be mad. And they talk about you behind your back. But you have the peace of God that passes all understanding. Amen? Amen. We're not afraid of what's coming upon the face of the earth. But persecution will come to all of those who live in Christ Jesus. Right? And many of the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers them out of them all. Sometimes that's through death. Sometimes that's through rapture. Sometimes that's through passing on. And sometimes it's right here on this earth, just depending. I've been through stuff. You've been through stuff. I'll go through more stuff. You'll go through more stuff. And through all of that, Jesus is going to be with us every single step of the way. Amen. That's our comfort. That is our comfort right there. But he says, pray that you're counted worthy to escape all of these things that are coming upon all those who dwell upon the face of the earth. See, this earth, not the terra firma, not the, not the planet, not the trees in the ocean, that belongs to God. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, right? But look at this with me real quick, and I won't belabor this point for long. Um, I could already see how this is going. So why don't you turn with me, where is it? Let's not turn to it because I don't want to take that much time. I'll quote it to you because you already know it. You could quote it back to me. Jesus, after he gets baptized by John the Baptist, spirit drives him into the wilderness, right? He goes out there. He fasts for 40 days. He's hungry. He's thirsty. At the end of that time, Satan, Satan himself comes to him and he tempts him. If you are the son of God, you're hungry. Turn these stones into bread. What was the big deal about that? Well, he's now going to use his divinity to get out of his situation. But he had to come do this as a man. So he didn't do that. And we know the scripture, you shall not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then he comes with them. And this is the one that we're going to look at right this minute. Not the, the one with the precipice and throw yourself down. But the second one. It says he takes them. Uh, maybe that's the third one. I don't know. He takes them and he's to a high place and he shows them all the kings of the world in a moment's time. Now, that's all the kingdoms of all time. Not just what was there in Rome where he was living right at that particular time in, under the Roman Empire. The Greek implies historically every kingdom of man that was from the beginning of time till the last kingdom. And he showed Jesus that. And he said to him, if you will just bow down to me, if you will just serve me, all of this I will give to you. And what did he say? How is that? Because they have been delivered to me. Adam handed him those keys. The earth system, the world system even though God instituted human government, it belongs to Satan. It is, it is God's earth, but it's Satan's world system that's governing and ruling this world right this minute. That includes the United States of America. That includes this country. The United States of America is not God's chosen land. They, we are not God's chosen people. 
you are saved out of this country. Look, I like our freedoms. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I like being able to stand up right this minute and talk to you guys and have a good time and y'all are laughing with me and I'm talking to you and nobody's coming in with machine guns or trying to cut my hands off or my head or take me to jail. That's cool. How many think that's cool? You like that? Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I mean we'll do the other if, we get, if that's how it's going to be, but, you know, I mean, this is better, I think. Um, so I appreciate everything. However, this isn't our home. This isn't our place. And we are not God's chosen people. And I'm watching we... As believers are watching the church get sucked into this, this world system today. We're getting sucked in until we're supposed to belong. We're supposed to participate. We're supposed to be part. That if you're a real Christian, it's your God to stand up for righteousness. Let's get a Supreme Court justice in. Let's get a righteous president. And it doesn't. They go on and on and on and on. Let's stamp out abortion. Okay, so they have their babies and then they go to hell. Or they abort their baby and they go to hell. They're still going to hell. We get the laws on the book and a, a tongue-talking American president who's shundala tundala uh, from the White House. <laughs> but the country's still not saved. Okay, the individual's still We've got every law in the book of righteousness. But you're still, what, what's the word, Judeo-Christian morals? Judeo-Christian morals. We just have a Judeo-Christian moral. Well, the Jews rejected Jesus. They are God's covenant people, though. The only nation on earth with whom God has made a covenant. The only nation of national people. You and I are amalgamated into the body of Christ. We're grafted into the vine, unnatural branches, grafted into the household of God, into the kingdom of God, citizens of heaven now. They are the natural branches. They will, once they go through their tribulation and they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, be regrafted, the natural branches. So much easier than it was to graft you and I in. Amen. But the United States of America or Great Britain or Kenya, none of these places are God's chosen nation and God's chosen people. Therefore, why are we as the church, why are we as believers caught up in trying to save and improve Satan's government and Satan's system and make it better? And I've heard a lot of manipulation and we all have and it's been going on for decades, but it's becoming very loud now from the, the media ministries and, and these kind of things about trying to save our nation and take over our nation. And people are getting antsy. I watched uh, uh, I don't know, these little 60 second, what do you call those things? TikToks or one of those kind of little, little things. And it was on a, a, some kind of a, a Trump rally that he was having. And I'm neither pro nor anti-Trump. He's an unsaved guy and if he becomes president, okay, good. Because God raises them up and God brings them down. And my vote doesn't change that. And I'm not telling you not to vote. And this is not about the country. But, I was, but it's, uh, all I'm saying is my trust is in the kingdom of heaven. And that's my citizenship. Although I like living here as I'm doing that. Right? But I watched this video. And there was just literally there was an ocean of people. I mean, just an ocean of people at this rally. And they're all <laughs> chanting two things. One had something with this guy named Brandon. Um, the <laughs> other one had to do, I don't know. Uh, the other one was, Trump, 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 Trump. And he stands there and goes, I am your voice. And they're chanting his name almost in worship. Almost, in, now he didn't ask for the worship in, in that one sense. And they're not, but they are. And this whole movement is more spiritual and religious than it is political and the church is being amalgamated into that and brought into that and they're setting churches up to be uh, voting centers and, and all of these these ridiculous foolish things that are unbiblical for you and I they're unbiblical for you and I because we've lost the focus and I keep saying we I'm talking about the visible church in this country because we live in America we don't live in Great Britain we don't live in Kenya we don't live in China we don't live in India we don't live you know, Singapore, this, this is where you and I live. This is our day-to-day -day life and what you and I have to contend with. And we are living in a spiritual climate where the weakness of the church, we no longer as a, the church in this country understand and discern the kingdom of God. And we're no longer looking up as a church. We're looking horizontally as a church. And I, my, uh, how many of you guys witness at your job? You know, I don't witness at my job at all. You know why? Because everybody there is saved. Um, however, in my department, since I oversee the facilities and the buildings and the projects and all that kind of, kind of stuff, I am continuously at Lowe's and Home Depot and, and supply houses and all these kind of things. So those are my mission 
feels uh, when I get chances to, to witness to people. Most of it takes place in those places. And it's interesting because you come across a lot of religious people who go to church and you go, we got some mega churches there. We got the McLean and Cornerstone and all of these places that are like nationally known ministries and these kind of things. And a lot, you run into a lot of people who go to these kind of things. And uh, talking with them and just getting into conversations with them, the conversation almost always goes, once they find you're a believer, it doesn't go up in the coming of Jesus. It goes down. It goes horizontal. And what do you think? And what about Joe Biden? And what about Donald Trump? And what about this guy down in Florida? I can't remember his name. Desant, Desant, Desantes. And what, about, and what do you think? And, and my answer is, my hope's not in any of these guys. I'm not looking for this nation to be saved. God doesn't save nations except for one, the nation of Israel. He saves people. He didn't say get involved in trying to transform your country. Now, this is like an ugly thing for people to say. It's like anathema. What's wrong with you? You're abdicating your responsibility as a believer. Show it to me in the scriptures, man, and I'll do it. But you don't see it. You don't see it. This is what he does say. And um, for the sake of time, I probably won't turn to most of these. But like 2 Timothy 2.4, he says, No soldier in active duty entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him. Okay, let's go back to Jesus. And this not being our kingdom and our focus, and we're not, you don't need to turn to this either because I'm, I'm trying to save some time here because I do want to get to 2 Peter 3. <clears throat> He's being, it's a, if you're a notes, if you're a note taker, um, it's John 18, 36. Uh, but this is when Jesus is standing before Pilate. And he said uh, to Jesus, hey, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says to him, why? Why are you asking me that? Did somebody tell you that? Did you figure that out on your own? Did Jews tell you that? He's like, I'm not a Jew. What do, what do I know about these things? And then Jesus says to him, look, you got nothing to worry about. My kingdom is not of this world. My, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would, not, would be fighting that I wouldn't be delivered into your hand. But my kingdom's not of this world. That's why they're not fighting. Now, why do you think that is? So why are we fighting? Why is the church today and people in the church and individuals in the church, why are we fighting for the United States of America? Why are we fighting for our rights in this country? You guys like guns? The white guy. <laughs> I like guns. I don't know. I don't shoot people yet with them but I like guns. Guns are pretty cool. But you know what? If they come and take my guns, I'm, in the natural, I'm a fighter. In the natural, I'm like, you will pry that from my cold, dead fingers. Blood. You know, that's, that's, that's me in the natural. Just try it. Just try I got more guns than you. But honestly, that's not my fight. My fight is not for my, my citizenship rights. And Christians get caught up into it. I'm just using that as an example of today. What's being emphasized in the church, what people are worried about, what they're concerned about. They're more concerned about their citizen rights in this country, in this nation, on this earth, because they have become what? Earth, earth dwellers. Earth dwellers. And I'm not telling you that I want them to come take our guns and to, and to make us all drive. Who, who in here has got an electric car? You better keep that hand down. <laughs> no. It costs a lot of money. Whether they want to make me drive electric cars or take away my, my, my V8, you know, engine with my four-wheel drive that's jacked up in these kind of things. I like those things. <laughs> However, I'm not here to fight for my right to drive a gas-powered engine. I'm not here uh, to fight the people who want to take all your rights, rights away in order to prevent climate change so that by the year 2011, we would have done 0.0002% improvement in the temperature. That's a real statistic, by the way, if we do everything and go all electric all across the world. Interesting, right? Yeah, yeah. That's how much will affect it over the next 70 whatever years, eight years, nine years, seven years, something like that. That's not my fight. Does it make me upset as a human being? 
Yes, it does. It bothers me when people want to come and fringe upon your rights. It bothers me when somebody, look, I'm a human being and born as a human being, born as a child of Adam, we are born with a little bit of a rebellious nature about us. Even the sweetest little one of you in here, right? Uh -huh. I bet she's mean. Uh -huh. She used to be a cop. <laughs> She's like, why are we talking about me? <laughs> we all have that in us. There's a certain point where people push us where you want to fight back, where you really want to retaliate, where you want to stand up for yourself, stand up for your rights, and these kind of a things. Jesus said, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting. But they're not, so they aren't. When Peter pulled his sword out and whipped that guy's ear, he said, dude, put it away. That's not how we're going to get there. We're going to get there through humility, the exact opposite of what the world does. Me as a natural guy, I don't care how big you are, I'm not going to back down. I might be stupid, but I'm not going to back down as a, as a general natural guy. Really. Uh, it's just kind of wisdom may kick in at some point, but that's not my first impulse or, <laughs> my first impulse or reaction. However, and you know, for us guys, that's how a man is a man, right? You're, you're, that, that's a man. That's, that's a real man. You're not afraid. That's not so in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, it is the opposite. It is through humility. It is through standing down. We're not talking about pacifism. I don't want to get off uh, on a rabbit trail with that. You can defend yourself and you can defend your family and your home. That's not what we're talking about here. But it's the road of humility, the exact opposite of standing up for yourself and demanding your rights that makes us the children of God. Amen. That's the character and the nature of a child of God. That's a different subject altogether there. I want to get back on course here a little bit. The point I'm trying to make here is the earth dweller mentality of you and I. There is a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure on people right this minute and economic conditions and these kind of things. I mean, uh, I know numerous people who are trying to buy homes, single family homes or, or, or first time home right this minute. And, uh, now, we've looked up the, the statistics. You guys are barely under sterling in terms of uh, income per capita and uh, real estate prices and these kind of things. And they just can't afford homes. They just can't buy a home because uh, a 2,500 square foot home costs $750,000 in, in, in sterling. And that's like around the nation. That can put a lot of pressure on an individual to want to make a change, to stand up and say, this isn't right. There's too many taxes. There's too much. And I agree with all of that. We all, Pastor Scott agrees with all of that. We agree that it's wrong. We agree that it's fundamentally abuse uh, on a governmental level. We agree that what we were to stand for and what the Constitution used to mean, we understand and we agree that it's being violated and desecrated and uh, rewritten or unwritten. We agree with that. We agree as citizens, we have these rights, but what we agree with more is this is not our home. Mm -hmm. What we agree with more is we are citizens of the kingdom of God. What we agree with more is we're to be looking up, not down, not across, not around. Mm -hmm. Our fight is against spiritual wickedness and principalities in high places, and it's not to get the laws changed. It's to see souls won. Yes. See people set free. It's to see deliverance. Yes. See marriages put back together, houses of the saved. It doesn't matter if a, an unsaved person, their marriage goes well or not. It kind of really doesn't matter in that one sense if you're still not going to heaven. We're here to see people born again into the kingdom of God. We're here to see those that are in the kingdom of God make it into the kingdom of God. The strong bearing the infirmities of the weak and just uh, if we got to drag somebody, you put one arm under there and you put them one on the other side and we're carrying this guy through to the kingdom of God. They're one of the weaker members in the body of Christ. Praise God. That's our fight. That's our fight. Our fight is for our souls. Our fight is for our faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Don't get caught up. Don't get distracted. All of this is going away. So why don't you go ahead on that note. Let's turn to uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. You gotta give me a second. This whole Bible is falling apart. I think I'm gonna have to retire it. I've been teaching out of it for, for quite a while. It's fallen. There we go. These pages back here are really all marked up and torn. Uh, Second Peter chapter three. Oh, gosh, there's a lot we could read here. Um, well, we'll see how much time allows us. We're gonna start in verse three. 
Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth is formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But the present heavens and the present earth by his word are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord is a thousand years as a day and a day is a thousand... I said that backwards, but a, a thousand years is a day and a day is a thousand years. The Lord is not slow about his promises, some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Now we're going to keep going. We're going to stop right there for a minute because there's a lot going on. This is the day that you and I are living in. The body of Christ as a whole, the rapture, rapture is hardly ever taught. It is some teachers will teach it, but then they do not require their congregation to live it because we read earlier, whoever has this hope purifies himself. Be holy as he is holy. Now, that's not the focus of our conversation right this moment. But the rapture by and large, the coming of the Lord, the imminent expectation of the Lord is being mocked. If it's not being mocked openly through words, because a lot of churches will still give a really, really good teaching on this. And most won't, but some still do. However, the people who adhere to the doctrine do not believe it. Why do you say that? Because I'm looking at their lives. We're looking at their lives. Are you judging their heart? No, I'm inspecting the fruit. You say that you believe the Lord could come at any moment. You say, yes, I am a pre-tribulational rapture and I can't wait to see the face of Jesus. But what are you doing? Man, you want to go to me with this, me with this Trump rally, just whatever it is. Wait a minute, brother. I thought you were looking for the coming of Jesus. Oh, I know, but, but to be a good citizen and da, 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 da. Man, you're looking horizontally. You need to be looking up. You know the Lord could come any moment. And then what's going to happen to all this? And, and this is where we're going to go to in just a second. What's going to happen to all of this? And where ultimately all your efforts are going to go? Now, I don't think it's a bad thing that people stop killing their babies. I don't think it's a bad thing if we lower taxes. I don't think it's a bad thing if we you know, start calling boys boys again and girls girls again and they can't swim again. You know. I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's a really, really good thing. Interesting, sidebar has nothing to do with this. Um, but uh, the guys, the plastic surgeons who like rebuilt all of this after my accident, uh, both they're wor very world renowned individuals. One of them called me up uh, like two weeks ago, something like that, and asked for permission to use my medical stuff in some books he's writing. He's done, done them before. I'd, they're medical journals, they're not, you know, they're not novels. They're things that have to do with like other people in classrooms. So I, I gave him my permission in these kind of things and I hadn't looked these guys up for a while. Both of these guys who did my surgery, I looked on both of their websites and listed under both of them, one guy, um, the guy who finished me up, he is now into uh, facial feminization and gender reaffirmation. I don't know. The other guy has clinical interest and under his interests are clinical interests are uh, gender trans, transition, is that the word? Yeah, gender transition and reconstruction. I'm like, these are the guys who re, re, rebuilt me. And they were really cool guys like 10 years ago when this happened, that's how they've gone. I would like to see that stopped. You know, I don't think that's good for anybody. I don't think it's good what's going on in the Loudoun County public schools. All of these things, if they change, praise God, that's good. However, however, every effort we make here to change Satan's government, ultimately it's going to burn, okay? Why do we want to make his system better? I, I agree in standing up for, for righteousness, but the salt and light you are is not political salt or political light. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is what it is. It's very core. It's very foundation. By faith you are saved through grace, and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God. The Romans 10, 9, and 10, the John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have a That is the salt and light that we are, by preaching the gospel and doing the word of God. Not by involving ourselves in all of these other activities, but the church by and large in this country is being swept 
into not just the political scene, but the whole spirit of antichrist movement, the spirit of tolerance. And you're hearing Christians say, I just respect their religion and I respect their right. I do not respect Islam. I do not respect Hinduism. I do not respect uh, Shintoism, Baha'i. Uh, I do not respect uh, Orthodox Judaism. I don't respect them. You know why? Because if you adhere to these, you will not see the kingdom of God. And it's deception. And I don't separate my American rights from my kingdom of heaven citizenship. No, I don't respect that. I don't respect your foreign heathen gods. I'm not coming against you. I'm not attacking you. I'm not criticizing you. I'm not anything with that. I am not anti any of this. I am pro Jesus. And I will tell you that he is the way, the truth and the life. And there is no other way to get to God. So let's hear the spirit of what I'm saying. I'm not saying you're being disrespectful, but the whole church is getting caught up in tolerance. I love a homosexual the same way I love a non-homosexual. There's nothing special about their sin. And I hear Christians quoting all of the time, well, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. He must have a special place. No, he doesn't. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world. The whole world. Sin has been done away. And now it comes down to who do you say that I am? The sin part has been removed. And now it comes down to belief. And your sin is not worse than their sin, and their sin is not worse than your sin. My sin is just as bad as the most reprobate individual who ever walked the face of the earth, because I am that guy, and so are you. So there's no special place uh, for their sin. But we do not tolerate it in the church. We do not accept it. We tell these people, you must repent and believe the gospel. But we're being caught up in this. And the world is telling us how, as believers, we are to be Christians. They're trying to tell Christians how to be Christians. And because of the pressure on the church, Christians are saying, oh, okay, okay, I respect you. No, I will stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will stand for the Bible, for the word of God. The Bible is the only truth, and I will stand for nothing else and accept nothing else. No, I will not visit with you at your church if you come to mine. I will not go visit your Muslim temple if you come to church with me. And we kind of trade, you know, favors. I won't do that because we have the way, the truth and the life. And there is no other way. And we're unapologetic. But we're living in a day where we have become apologetic as a people, as a nation. The believers in this nation are now really just more moralists more than anything else and have no understanding how they've accepted the spirit of Antichrist into their hearts and into their lives. And rather than reproving the system, have become part of the system and amalgamated into it. We are highly, Pastor Scott is a criticized man. You ever notice that? Yeah, doesn't have a lot of friends outside of the church. And within the church, professed church, even less. You know, it's always the religious people, and you guys know this, who are the worst critics, the most hateful, the most damaging. I mean, who turns Jesus over to the Romans, to Pilate? The high priest, man, the high priest, the religious world of that day, the church that's feeling the pressure and is now caving to the world system and becoming part of the world system rather than reproving the darkness. They're amalgamating with this and saying, but what about those other Christians over here? These other guys who they're so they just refuse to move off of this thing. Can't they just like compromise a little bit to take some of the pressure off so that we don't all go down with them? I know. Let's get rid of them. Let's stamp those guys out. They're hateful. They're, they're one-minded. They're bigoted. No, we're single-minded. And we're full of the love of God. And we're full of commitment to the true and living God. And we're committed to his word. And we stake our lives and make our stand on this word. We live and die with this word, with his word. It's our delight. It's our daily bread. It's our food. It's who and what we exist on the relationship we have with Father through Jesus Christ. And there is no other way. There is no, there is no compromise. But we're building, building, building in this world and evolving ourselves. And again, when I say we, I'm not speaking of this ministry because very few people within this ministry are doing this. And I have no problem if you have a political uh, affiliation. I mean, I voted last time for the first time in quite a while, and I voted for a Republican guy. 
You had a rotten apple on this side, it had a rotten orange on this side. Well, the orange tastes better, so. And Trump looked kind of like an orange. But, um, so, I voted for the orange, you know? But really, God raises them up and puts them down. And I'm not concerned about who gets in the White House. I'm not concerned if a man with dementia gets reelected or his person, what's that, uh, Kamala, if she becomes president. What's going to happen if she becomes president? This nation's going down. Praise God, then it was his will. Can you still believe Jesus and be a Christian under that? We're not going to turn to it, but Paul tells you to pray for the, the people in authority and the governmental authorities that you could live a peaceable life, man. He's, that is the prayer for these people. Now, he's praying this, and you know who are like the kind of guys Paul was under? And I don't have all of these guys in order and which ones crossed Paul's life. And you're talking Domitian, Caligula, Nero. You know, you guys know who these people are? Like the, the Roman Caesars who like hated Christians. Uh, was it... Uh, Nero, that burned them on his wall, right? And Paul's saying, pray for these guys that your lives may be peaceable. There are Christians in Russia. There are Christians in Iran. There are Christians in China who are persecuted each and every day. I want, and they're Christians and they're thriving. I wonder if you and I can be, be believers uh, under a, an American socialistic government. Think we could pull it off? You think maybe Jesus is still going to be Jesus and the word of God is still going to be true if our rights are stripped away and taken away from us? Do you think maybe that we could still stand and believe God during those times? Do you think that he's still going to meet our every need according to his riches and glory? Do you believe it's going to change? We've never seen the righteous forsaken of God's seed begging bread. Do you believe the parable of the, the, uh, the sparrows and how they don't, sown or any of these kind of things or reap, but like God feeds them or the, the lilies of the field that even Solomon in all of his glory wasn't arrayed as one of these. Your father knows what you have. Need. We believe that's going to change because of the pressure coming from without, the persecution coming on the church. Do you believe God's word's going to change and you're not going to be provided for, not just naturally, but spiritually in every way? Do you believe that you can still survive and keep your faith and your family's faith can stay intact even if they come and they dispossess you and take away your house, like they talked about in the book of Hebrews, how you joyfully receive the seizure of your properties and your imprisonments. Can you still be a believer? Can Jesus still be Jesus? Can God still be God under those circumstances? I submit to you that we, he can and he is and he will. God won't change. Are you going to? That is the question. So what are you banking on? What are you building on right this minute? Are you building on this earth? Are you counting on this earth? I keep hearing guys and we need to, and this is such an interesting one to me. Pastors, we need to hold back that judgment of God. We're trying to hold back that judgment of God. You can't hold back the judgment of God. And why do you want to hold back the judgment of God? Because it's the judgment of God. And the judge of all the earth will do what? Right. right. Mm. The judge of all the earth will do right. And the song says, your words are right concerning everything. Okay. Psalms 191, one of those, lots of verses that are in that one psalm. Uh, 119, I'm sorry. There's no Psalm 199. If you can find Psalms 199, if I can find it, I'm a heretic. Um, get back on course here a little bit with this. What are you building on? What are you putting your trust in? You can't hold back the judgment of God uh, in that one sense. I hear guys quoting, and this one always baffles me. Uh, they want to quote Abraham. If perchance 40 people that are righteous, 30, 20, 10, when he's going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah, will you hold back for 10 righteous people? I will not. And of course he does it anyway because there's none righteous, no, not one, right? <laughs> Amen. So the judgment fell. But they hold that to America, to the country that you and I Again, this is where you and I live. We don't live in China. We don't live in Russia. We don't live in India. Where you and I live. Let's hold back that judgment of God. And do you think if God was willing to spare Sodom and Gomorrah for 10 people, he's going to judge America with all these believers in here? Then they start quoting, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and they will repent of their wickedness, and they'll call upon the name of the Lord, then I will come and I will heal their land, etc., etc., etc. That was a specific promise given to the nation of Israel, not the United States of America. 
not India, not China, not any other nation. That is a specific promise to a specific national people. You are forgiven based on your faith in Jesus Christ, right? You are blessed based on your faith in Jesus Christ. Your regeneration, your adherence, trust in, your trusting in, adhering to, relying upon the word of God and the finished work of Jesus on the cross. The nation doesn't get that. Only people out of the nation, which is you and which is me and your family and all you come across, witness to them, tell them about Jesus. But God does not save nations except for one, which he will at the end of the tribulation deliver them. One nation. And we're going to be amalgamated back together. But they quote this, that God's not going to judge America because of all these believers. And we have the national days of prayer. And we come together in these prayer thons and this and this and this and this. And he's going to hold it back. Why are you concerned about that, man? Are you afraid that you're going to suffer persecution? You're going to lose your prosperity? Because I think that's what it comes down to. Really, self-preservation. Me, my life, my house, my job, my comfort, my car, my swimming pool. I don't have a swimming pool, but if you had a swimming pool. My vacations. I just went on a really nice vacation, you know. I go on a pretty nice vacation every year um, relative to my means. Uh, I like those. Uh, but are you afraid you're going to lose yours? Is that your concern? For that, are you willing to compromise? For that, are you willing to back off just a little bit? Everything you built, I've heard people saying, man, I hope the Lord doesn't come back until I get married or until I have kids. I'm like, that's a foolish statement. It is a foolish statement to make. And I'm not even going to go into how foolish that is. Everything on this earth is going to, let's, let's move down here a little bit. I'm about out of time. I've got a little less than 10 minutes left. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. We heard that a little earlier in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and the works will be burned up. Since all of these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for the hastening and the coming of the day of the Lord, on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth, which will... <clears throat> in which righteousness will dwell. Listen, my wife and I have said this ever since we've known each other. When we're like, we get worked up or concerned about something, we just say, it's going to burn. It's all going to burn. And my position at Calvary Temple, you know, it's kind of, the rewards will come for, from the heart that went into it. But uh, I like engineer things, you know, like the, the, the sanctuary roof uh, ceiling in there and all this. I engineer those things. I just built a sign out front. We, all these kind of things. And uh, a lot of my involvement, you know, it's interesting what pastors do. You know, they, they build things if your name is Les. You build things and then you preach sometimes and you, and you minister to people as well. However, uh, that's what I do. And a lot of my focus, my department that I oversee, it's a vast department and there's multiple people in it. Um, but we, we put all this time and energy and effort in things, and you should be. You have to maintain the, the facilities that, that you live in, that, that, that you meet in. But it can be real disheartening sometimes to say, man, I just spent a year and a half doing this, and I stayed up from 8 in the morning until 12 midnight every night and worked on Saturdays and did all these kind of things, and all the group came together. And then the tribulation is going to come after that, and it's going to get destroyed. And then after the millennial reign, and whatever survives that, after the millennial reign, the very elements are going to melt with intense, fervent heat, the Word of God says. On a molecular level, this earth is going to come apart and be made of brand new heavens and a brand new earth. Again, and all of those things are not going to be here. It'd be pretty disheartening. However, <laughs> however, we do that in our lives. We build our lives on the here and now. And how much energy, listen, you have to have somewhere to live. You have to have food. You have to wear clothes. With food and raiment, be content. We know that God blesses us above and beyond that. Jesus just gave the biblical definition of what poverty really is. If you don't have any clothes, you don't have anything to eat, you poke. All right? <laughs> if you got those things, you're doing okay. Might not be comfy. Might not be what you prefer. But he said, with these things, be content. Now, the fact is, you and I have never known anything other than that. I mean, some have more money than others, and you may have had hard times, but I don't, I don't see any swollen bellies in here from starvation, maybe from other things. <laughs> I, have to go on, hey, I have to go on a diet once a year. I'll gain 12 pounds, and the winter comes along, and I'll lose it again, and I'll look good for like another three months, and it comes back. I'm not one to talk. However, 
We are a prosperous people here, but we have to have food. We have to have raiment. Uh, we all live in houses. We, most of us have to pay for cars to get back and forth to work so we can pay for the car, right? So we can pay for the house um, so we can have food and we can give to the Lord and we can share. These are, the Lord knows all of this. These are, are the day-to-day -day necessities of life, but how much of your life is given to it? How much of your trust is in it? Do you guys remember 2008 when we had the, the real estate collapse in this country, the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, all that kind of stuff? People in Sterling, people I know, good friends of mine, there in the congregation, literally lost 100% of their retirement. 100% of their retirement. One of my friends there, um, we were talking about it one day, his retirement. He was not, wasn't, wasn't that far from retirement at the time. And uh, I said, well, how's it going for you guys? Well, if I, instead of retiring, if I work like another 15 years, I may be able to save $100,000 and be a burden to my children. Because it all took wings and flew away, and it wasn't even this guy's fault. You see, because you can't bank on anything here. But let's say that you do well here and you amass a fortune or just a good stable life and your retirement is set in all of these kind of things. Are you now trusting it? Because guess what? It's going to burn. Is your hope in it? Is your trust in it? Is that what you spent your energy and your life into? Or did you pour it into the body of Christ? Did you pour it into your brother and sister? Did you pour it into worship and praise of the Lord and serving him? Did you pour it in? Uh, into becoming a humble individual and a servant of all and the least in the body of Christ. Have you poured it into doing that? Is that where your efforts are going? See, because we don't have time to look at any of these other scriptures that I have, but said there's a time coming where God's going to shake everything and everything that, can't, that can be shaken will be shaken and only those things that cannot be shaken are going to remain and the only things that will remain are those things that God has done that you have allowed God to do in you and through you in your life and nothing else will remain. Therefore, he says down further in this passage when we just read it, seeing that all these things are going to happen and the elements are going to melt with fervent heat and all our energy, all our effort, all the works of our hands, read Ecclesiastes, you'll get depressed. Okay, read all of these things of the works of your hands. They're going away. Only what is in Jesus is going to remain. He says, therefore, what manner of people ought we to be? Did you spend your life trying to protect your rights? Did you spend your life trying to fix Satan's system in his world? Did you spend your life trying to amass your fortune without saying that that's what you're doing? Because it's all going away. It's all going to burn. It's going to dissolve with fervent heat. It's going to be gone. Therefore, what manner of an individual ought you to be? Where should your treasures be? See, our hope and our citizenship is in heaven. Abraham was looking for a city, right? His builder and maker was God. Foundations not made with hands. And he was a wealthy man, but he had no trust, no contentment uh, with the natural world. I don't mean he was not a content man in the Lord's provisions. I mean, he wasn't content to be an earth dweller. He wanted Jesus. He wanted father. He wanted his Messiah. Job, in all of his opulence, wanted father. I know that my Redeemer lives, and though he slay me, I'm going to stand before him in my flesh. I know I'm going to see him. That's where his heart was set. That's where his affections were. Where are yours tonight? I'm all in. How about you guys? You all in? And I'm going to try to stay all in, and I'm going to have you help me stay all in and keep me accountable, and I'll keep you accountable, right? as believers in the body of Christ, and we'll see our way through. And if you see your brother and your sister, hey, bro, you're looking a little horizontal right now. You're getting a little worked up about what's going on in the world. You're getting a little worked up about this pressure at work. You're getting a little worked up about this guy in charge or that leader or this political person or this condition or this. You get a little worked up. Remember, look up. Your redemption is drawing near. Comfort one another with these words. Amen? Amen. All right. Father, we come before you tonight in the name of your son, Jesus, Lord. We thank you for your goodness, your grace, your salvation, the provision for eternal life, for the shed blood of Jesus on the cross and that he died on that cross. He took the blow that was due me. They were my sins. It was my wickedness. It was my rebellion. And yet he took the punishment for it upon himself and he paid for it on the cross. What a great love you showed us in this, Father God. And you revealed yourself to our hearts, Father God, and filled us with your Holy Spirit and given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. And we thank you and we praise you, Father God, for it. We pray that you keep our hearts focused, not looking at this world, not looking for the hope that's here on this earth, but looking for our maker, Father, looking for Jesus to come and to split those clouds and to call us up at the last trumpet and to take us away. The dead in Christ rising first, then we here alive be caught up together with them, Father. 
That's our hope. And so we shall ever be with the Lord, Father. So we shall ever be. And we thank you for that, Father. Lord, I just want to pray for Pastor Jim right now. As he's on vacation getting rest, I pray that he's, as he's down there and he's getting rest for his body and his mind, that nonetheless, he's still a pastor of this church, that you speak to his heart. Even as he's down there, you're putting your words down in him and giving him direction and guidance and solidifying the vision that's in him, Father God, that you've placed in him. And we thank you for that anointing that's on, he and his, on him in his life, Father God. And we thank you for Pastor Jimmy, Father as a faithful servant under his father and an assistant pastor father here, that you would anoint him to do the word of God, to be instant in season and out of season, Father. And we're asking you to give your angels charge over them, Father, and to bring them home back to this congregation safely, Father, anointed and fresh and ready to give direction. And Father, we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, look up. Look up. All right, I'm out.